So my first conversion came when a revival preacher came to our church on a Sunday night. It felt like he was pointing his finger right at me and all the other unsaved kids in the front row who had to sit in the front row for the special service. And with fire and brimstone, he said, if Jesus came back tonight, your mommy and daddy would be taken to heaven and you would be left all by yourself. Got my attention. (laughs) I was getting up in years. I was six. (laughs) And I realized I'd have a five-year-old sister to support if that were to happen. My mother, caring mother, reassured me that it wasn't about the wrath of God, but that God loved me and God wanted me to be his child too. So it sounded good, and I signed up. My second conversion, though, came later, when I was a teenager. So I was born and raised in Detroit, the Motor City. And when I got to be about 16, I began to listen to my city. I mean, hear the news read the papers, get some books, and, and have some conversations with those adult people in my life. And the more I listened and learned, some very big questions began to emerge for me. I began to feel like something very big and very wrong was happening in my city and my country, and even my church. First thing I learned was the adults around me, they didn't want to talk about all of this, ever. But I remember the questions I had and, and asked them. I said, how come life in black Detroit seems so different than life in our white Detroit? How come? Why is that? And I'm hearing of people who are poor and hungry in our city of Detroit and who don't have jobs or enough jobs. Some live in bad housing and dangerous places. And some even have family members in jail. I mean, I didn't know anybody for whom that was true in their lives. So why was this true in the lives of others who weren't very far from us, a few miles or a few blocks. I also remember their answers to my questions. First was, son, you're too young to ask these questions. When you get older, you'll understand. Or we don't know why it's that way either, but it's always been that way. Finally, I got an honest answer when I was told, (laughs) if you keep asking these kinds of questions, you're going to get into a lot of trouble. And that proved to be true. Knowing I wasn't going to get real answers to my questions in my world, I decided to travel to another world. I tell my students all the time, trust your questions, trust your questions, and follow them to wherever they take you. So I took my naive white boy questions into what we call the inner city of Detroit in those years. And I was trying to figure out why life was so different in black and white Detroit and why we were so separated. I remember I needed some money for college, so I took some jobs alongside young black men in Detroit, hoping they could answer my questions. And I began to hear life stories that were so different than mine. Life stories that would ultimately change change my life story. Remember I went to the black churches. The question I'd asked about my, my home churches 
why hadn't we ever been told about black churches? <laughs> why hadn't we ever visited them or been visited by them? Well, now I went to see them. I just showed up. Just showed up. I was warmly welcomed. And people patiently and generously answered my obvious questions. But then the big epiphany came. The big epiphany. Through a friend, a new friend. He was a fellow janitor and fellow op elevator operator. That's how old I am. <laughs> he wanted to take me home for dinner to meet his family one night. So we went. I will never forget the words his mother spoke to me. I mean, he and I were having a conversation about the D Detroit police and how the way they treat black people in our city was causing more and more confrontations. And she said words to me I'll never forget. She said, so I tell my kids, if you're ever lost, can't find your way home, and you see a white policeman, duck under a stairwell, hide behind a building, wait till he passes, then come out and find your way home on your own. She wasn't a political militant. She was just a mother who wanted to raise and protect her kids, like my mom. And when she spoke my mother's words, what she told us, her five kids, just screamed in my head. If you ever lost, can't find your way home, look for a police. Policemen are our friends. They'll take you by the hand and bring you safely home. Two different mothers, two different sets of advice for what they told their kids, if they're black or white. Two different worlds, I learned. Butch and I were born in the same city, we lived in different countries, different countries. And so our families, and, and the more I listened and learned, I, this double standard affected everything. Everything. And so the more I listened, I began to realize that racism wasn't just personal, it was structural. So I compared Butch's family to my own, my own dad, James E. Wallace Sr. My dad graduated from college, got commissioned in the Navy, and got married all on the same day. Busy day. They're trying to get the troops out to the war in Europe and the Pacific where he was sent. I remember when my dad came home from the war, and all the GIs like him got two really big things. Uh, an FHA loan to buy your first house as a family, which we did. And then a GI bill to pay for the education of GIs like my dad. So it created this neighborhood in Redford Township where we live near Detroit of all these three-bedroom ranch houses, all headed by a GI like my dad. But the black sailors on my dad's ship never got access to those huge benefits that provide, provide housing and education, which is what makes families middle class. My government made my family middle class. They didn't get access to that. Any black GIs didn't get that. They, they were racially excluded from really the two biggest affirmative action programs in the history of our country. And that racialized our geography. That made my neighborhood all white, my school all white, and my church all white. And the more I learned, it affected 
everything I learned about civil rights and voting rights and job opportunities, economic life and education, policing, criminal justice, and how our kids can remain safe and who you went to church with. But that was years ago, right? I'm an old guy, that was years ago. Haven't we made incremental progress? Sure. Is it enough? A lot of white folks I know think it is, or it should be. Most black families I know don't think so. I mean, slavery is in the past, right? And didn't the civil rights movement fix all this stuff? Dr. King and Rosa Parks, didn't they fix all this stuff? Can't we please just stop talking about race? I hear that all the time today. Can't we just stop talking about race and just move on? Can't we stop asking these questions? The answer is no. The answer is no. In fact, we have to now rise to a new level because what we see happening around us is, well, let's call it what it is. America's original sin, which means a racial hierarchy, human hierarchy, <laughs> based on skin color. It's still with us, it lingers, it, as Brian Stevenson said, it has evolved. And now there's a whole myriad of voter restrictions, new laws, regulations, principles, practices, here and all over the country that are designed to once again, once again, make it harder for people of color to vote. Designed that way. And even to prevent their votes from being fairly counted. We have a new battle today for voting rights. Brand new battle. And I want to suggest today that that battle is a religious matter. It's a religious issue. I mean, it's a test of both democracy and our churches, a test of both. It's a moral test for democracy and a theological test for our churches and the faith of our churches. I mean, do we believe what we read in the first book First chapter of the Bible, Genesis 1, 26, reads, Then God said, Then God said, Let us create humankind in our own image, after our own likeness. Do we believe that? Or not? Do we believe in the image of God? or not? Do we believe in Imago Dei, or not? Are we the Imago Dei movement, or are we not? There is a new strategy for white supremacy in our modern time. It can be stated in a single sentence. To prevent changing demography, from changing our democracy. They can't stop changing demography, but they want to reassert white minority rule by any means necessary, including voter suppression, overt, covert, gerrymandering, redistricting. Uh, restricting immigration to make sure there aren't as many brown voters, judicial bias that rises up all the way to the Supreme Court. And now election denial. Election denial, electoral corruption, electoral manipulation. These are things that are with us now and time to see that America's original sin 
is really making a comeback. <laughs> a comeback to prevent a united democratic future for this country. And when all those tactics don't work, then they go to the promotion of political violence, as we've seen on January the 6th. All these tactics, all these things are growing. They're increasing, and their threat is greater and greater every day to this nation, to the soul of this nation. And what's happening is really an old ideology called, let's call it America's original sin, an old ideology is combining with an old heresy. Old ideology with an old heresy. That old heresy is called white Christian nationalism. You see it all the time, TV, T-shirts. I'm a white Christian nationalist, members of Congress say. White Christian nationalism is a grievous sin and a biblical heresy. I mean, even the name spells the heresy. It's white. In the face of a gospel that is more humanly diverse and inclusive than any message on the earth. It claims to be Christian, but it implies domination, not service. And nationalism, I mean really. We have an international commission from Jesus who told us to go into all the world making disciples of all nations. White Christian nationalism doesn't cross lines, it draws lines. It doesn't unite us, it divides us with, with darkness and lies. White Christian nationalism is leading the country, it's taking the country to fear, it leads to hate, that can lead to violence. White Christian nationalism defies the teaching of Jesus to love our neighbors and even our enemies. So I want to say today, I'll be bold and even proclaim today, if I might, that it has become a Christian sacred duty to fight and defeat the false gospel of white Christian nationalism with the true gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's time to cross the color line, the democracy. If we could do that, it would be the beginning of repentance and repair and even, and even, even redeeming America's original sin for us white folks. It's time to cross the color line of democracy because it opens a whole new world for us. It just helps us find the truth, as Jesus says, that can make us free, free of the bondage and baggage of white supremacy. It's time to cross the color line of democracy because it could open up a whole new world, networks of bonding relationships that could form the fabric and the foundation for the common good. This is for Washington. This is for our own congregations and communities. It means talking to your friends and families. It means loving each other as brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. It also will be taking us closer to that wonderful vision that our nation's civil rights leaders have called us to for years, the beloved community. The beloved community. Now there's a role here for people of faith. There really is. What if we could help the nation cross this color line, the democracy, this polarized, divided nation? We would be called the peacemakers, whom Jesus calls the children of God. My friends, it is time for courageous personal faith that could lead us to the public discipleship that will be necessary in the days ahead.
And for that, may God bless us all.